Well, thank you, Terry, and um, thank you to everybody else, uh, Helen and and Katerina, of course, for putting together the series. And one of the interesting things about invisibility is that there's all of this stuff that goes on behind what we see, and most of that stuff that goes on behind what we see occupies this space or this state of invisibility. And what they do seems like nothing. You put together a few people to speak, and people come. It's a lot of work. <laughs> Believe me. It, it, I, I didn't have to do much of it. They had to do almost all of it, and it, it is very clearly a lot of work. So we should really, truly appreciate what they do because it is a very, very helpful venue. And the other thing I have to tell you is that um, uh, I'm not used to working in a building that has heat, so I'm going to be a little uncomfortable <laughs> as, we, as we speak because our building doesn't have heat, and I, I prepared... Um, I have an extra shirt underneath, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how that's going to work out, but uh, I'll just jump right in. Um, and uh, to be sure, I, I prepared sort of a half academic talk in recognizing that it's a public forum. I prepared a talk that is uh, um, going to be complicated in some areas, in other areas it will be very accessible. As it says on the board, hold your breath and hope for the best. And I'll just jump right in. Few things so well define the line between success and failure, or even doing and not doing, than pressure, and pressure's bedfellow urgency. Now, these two things are so ambiguous and come in so many different forms that they escape capture in concrete terms in most circumstances. Pressure and urgency are often invisible. They cannot be seen and generally require a substantial amount of self-reflection until and unless they are externalized or quantified or embodied outside of ourselves. In feeling pressure, the process of invisibility is at work. Feeling no pressure, it's still at work. The distinction between feeling and not feeling explains the multidimensionality of invisibility. That it can either be somniferous or omniferous, it can cause you to just float your way through life. Or it can feel as though it's heavy and weighted upon you. Invisibility can be quite concrete, even though it may not be seen. And if given a chance, can be the difference between success and failure, doing and not doing. In his book, Making Ideas Happen, Scott Belsky argues that ideas are easy, but tangible results are hard. I have argued somewhat the contrary, that inspiration is easy, but that ideas take work. Splitting the difference, going somewhere in the middle, I would suspect that ideas perhaps are difficult, but realizing them is even harder. And I have to tell you, it, it, I was kind of reluctant about this whole idea, so I'm talking about invisibility. And then I recognized one important thing. Once I tell you I'm going to talk about it, I'm stuck. Because now you have expectations. And once I tell you what I think, I'm subject to your expectations. Tied up in this space are multiple simultaneous layers that intervene and intersect. And towards an understanding of these layers as concurrent dimensions of practice, well, that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to suggest that having felt the pressure and the urgency of standing before you today and speaking. I hope to make explicit, if somewhat abstract, my emerging thoughts on invisibility. And do encourage you to hold your breath and really, as I said, hope for the best. Much of what I'm going to say will be obvious to you. Some of it will be perplexing, and in the end, sense will only occur in the very spaces of invisibility in which I'm asking you to play. So let me start off by suggesting that we can go from the abstract and hope for the concrete. Mm. Sorry. I should turn the volume. Known unknowns. That is to say, we Let's know do that again. Some things we do. There are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown <coughs> unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. So about these things that we don't know that we don't know, well, I would suggest that there's a difference between learn it, being learned and being wise. And no one can say for sure what that difference is. But to my mind, being learned is a measure of misrecognizing knowledge as truth and truth as absolute, where being wise accepts that knowledge is fleeting and seeking an absoluteness in these truths is absurd, if necessary. 
Rod McCalco suggests that the oracle, the wisest among us, is often blind. And as a wise person, that this blindness allows the dampening of the overcompetence of sight. Seeing is not believing, but is disbelief that there is something more. And that invisible something is of profound relevance and has a magnificent poetic flexibility, yet is too often recognized as the negation of seeing in a very simple way. And seeing is thought to be equal to believing when it is, in fact, doubt. Invisibility is not the unseen, but the knowledgeable in the sense of opposition to wise. Seeing is a sense of certainty through doubt, of the possibility that tr the truths before our eyes are incomplete and limited by our own human limitations. The only thing about which one can be certain is that one can only know anything through an act of willful ignorance. I must purposefully and strategically ignore that which is outside my system of knowing in order to legitimize and animate that which I come to think of as true. I'm going to suggest that invisibility is a very pervasive concept. And on the, con uh, on the pervasiveness of invisibility, though my research is at an early and preliminary phase, and much of what I will tell you today falls into the category of half-baked ideas, a work in progress, let's say. That's the nice way to put it. I found invisibility across a broad academic and social and natural spectrum. In literature, we see invisibility take the form of the disembodied voice of the narrator. We also see, and I just discovered this because I'm reading the uh, Harry Potter books with my kids, uh, J.K. Rowling, her entire fame and billion dollar fortune is predicated on understanding and manipulating invisibility. In theology, invisibility is the basis of the doubt that leads to belief or faith. Invisibility manifests itself across a variety of, a variety of platforms and religious stories. Invisibility, to a certain degree, induces the faith that allows us to deal with magnificent pointlessness of suffering. In history, invisibility occupies a variety of locations. Invisibility of the, uh, of the historian occurs in the place of historicity, figuring out the point, of the point of the observer and making sense of that. But history also allows us to look at invisibility as a point of ignoring. How do we forget that which, uh, those places from which we came? In the natural sciences, his, uh, invisibility can be seen both as a challenge and as, uh, uh, as a process to overcome. We spend so long in the quest for micro microscopy, for instance, to find an explanation or uh, find an explanation for things we cannot see, or at least not see with the with, with the naked eye. But the reason we do so is for the uh, is to develop an ability to control the unexpected or the un uh, the the unseeable. We can also see the spread of germs and disease as a process of understanding invisibility. Epidemiologists spend their whole life figuring out where things come from. They look for patient zero. They figure out how patient zero gets from one place to the next. They look for these invisible webs of circulation. In economics, for instance, yeah, it's gross. In <laughs> economics, for instance, we also have to require ourselves in a capitalist system to forget that in a finite world, as Zygmunt Bauman ar argues, for anyone to be wealthy, someone must be poor. And for us to get more, someone has to have less. But we ignore these things. This process of ignoring is a necessary process that helps us negotiate our lives. Andrea Briganti, writing out of the University of uh, Trento in Italy, describes invisibility as a supplicant condition to his argument for visibility as a viable and relevant social category. He suggests that visibility should be thought of beyond a realm of seeing, saying that visibility is relationship, strategy, field, and process. And while Brigenti's framework is incredibly helpful in complicating visibility to the level of categorical status, it does not go far enough to recognize the impact of invisibility as a separate social category itself that works outside of a simple binary of seeing and not seeing. Invisibility occupies the same theoretical space that Brigenti describes, relationship, strategy, field, and process, yet it goes beyond the binary of seeing because invisibility is the groundwork for all of our understanding of the world, both within and beyond seeing. Placed as a part of a dependent hierarchy, visibility is more complex than invisibility, therefore visibility is more dependent on invisibility than the other way around. 
Anthony Wilden in the early 80s developed the concept of dependent logical hierarchies to help classify the layers of order that can be found in the world that allow us to make sense of objects and ideas in complex systems such as society. Of the various layers of complexity, and this sounds bizarre, of the various layers of complexity, those towards the top are more concrete and perhaps less changeable than those that are more complex and follow. This means that since visibility emerges from invisibility, it is invisibility that pervades all aspects of the visible. As Bregenti himself argues using Goffman and Merleau-Ponty, invisibility is that which enables our ability to see. It is the context without which we cannot see. Goffman suggests in my own preliminary research supports this finding that the ordinary, the everyday, cannot be seen until and unless there is a disruption to the invisible thus rendering the invisible more potent and far more pervasive. Invisibility is pervasive because it operates outside of the binary of seen and unseen. Indeed, if visibility is figure, invisibility is the ground upon which that figure can be, on, uh, on, uh, upon which that figure can be understood. The interesting irony is that we tend to ignore the ground for sake of the figure. What do you see here? Chess pieces. Chess pieces? Figures in between. Yeah, there's people. So these are figures, these are figures. This is entirely a context. It's one of those little puzzles, whether you see the old woman or the young woman, whether you see the, uh, the shark or the dolphin. It's one of those figure ground kind of considerations. We don't always necessarily see the context or the ground. We often see the figure. But what this describes is that there's a relationship between the two. <clears throat> so I'm going to move on to the semantic dimensions of invisibility. There's a certain blissfulness to ignorance, <laughs> taken in a literal sense that ign uh, of ignoring that about which one ought not be worried, that allows us to navigate, navigate an increasingly complicated world. This ignorance, I argue, must be thought of as a part of a broader process of negotiation. The name I give that process is invisibility, but in naming it, I neither betray its necessity nor its anonymous operation. One simply acknowledges a dynamic point of entry to question what Louis Althusser calls the always alreadiness that structures our interpolation into a process of replication rather than novelty. To be sure, as Gregory Bateson suggests, redundancy, or this replication, is necessary in both nature and society, but it's always an act of counterflow. It is why, as my daughter describes it, little kids see airplanes when adults do not. Adults can see airplanes, and indeed can hear them. But they've so located the banality of the airplane to an expected location in a cacophony of sounds in an increasingly multi-layered world that airplanes become invisible. There but not there, seen but unseeable. Children, the younger the better, before they are disabused of a sense of serendipity and wonder, occupy a much more textured world than adults. Not through ease of access or breadth of exposure, but by virtue of a lack of experience and integration. The more deeply and more broadly we explore the world, the more the world becomes normal and invisible to us. It becomes ordinary, expected, unseeable. There, but not there. And you can see this when you're driving to work and you don't notice anything on the side of the, on the, side of the road. Invisibility is not a product, it is a process towards an outcome, being invisible. This is why children are thought to dislike spinach. At least this is my idea. A taste of spinach is tenable to adults, not because it's good, because it's not, but because of the process of invisibility. But for children, the taste of spinach is less tenable because it is not as invisible as it is for adults. Aside from the fact that spinach is icky, which it is, children's taste buds are structured differently and mature into adulthood, in part dampening the ickiness of spinach and making it more ordinary and less extraordinary. Over time, with experience and through developmental changes, the ickiness of spinach, and really foods in general, diminish. And if you like spinach, sorry. But if you don't like spinach, then substitute your food there. It's not that the foods become less icky, it's that the way we encounter the foods change. The process of invisibility introduces layers of ignorance that permit our palates, ignorance in the sense of ignoring, permit our palates to learn to, and expand by rendering more ordinary and thus more invisible the objectionable through a multi-dimensional practice of dampening the foreign and perhaps unpalatable. Spinach loses its ickiness 
or its power to be icky as we grow older. We can still see the same object, but it can neither be heard nor felt the same way when we eat it. Visualization, I would argue, is an almost unnatural act of fixing boundaries onto porous and interconnected things that are forever changing, both in the internally and by virtue of the constant flux of the environments in which they are met. Perhaps this is why we maintain our distaste for foods throughout a lifetime, as, an asso as associations of invoked by appearance. The appearance of food causing us to dislike it or feel that it is eaten <coughs> is a demonstration of the multidimensionality of invisibility. This is not to say that visualization is an irrational act, but that visualization is not of nature, but of humanity. It is expedient and necessary to manage negotiation through a hyper-complicated system of infinite possibilities. We are wont to see, we are wont to forsake what else in order to name what, simply as a matter of need. Were it not that we ignore the expected, the ordinary would be overwhelming. But when the expected is taken to be truth, we end up in what Nietzsche describes as a web of lies that we must not recognize as lies, but for the <coughs> sake of madness. The invisible is the always already there. It is the font of everything, but it is seen as nothing because everything is too big, too thick, and too difficult to calculate. We, for instance, necessarily want to know and not hope. Because if we want to decide between the certainty of taking a step onto what ought to be safe ground versus falling down, we require the visible to negotiate the ordinary. Yet visibility is not certainty, but doubt. It is only through doubt that there is something else, that the invisible, that one can be certain. Visibility then represents doubt of the something else, rather than certainty of the something. Doubt is, nece is a necessary tool for flattening the complicated into the complex, and the complex into the manageable, if only by limiting possi or prob possibility into probability and relegating prob probability into degrees, and permitting the valuation of those degrees into succinct and discrete taxonomic units that we can organize in a manageable and meaningful way. The invisible then is not the opposite, the visible then is not the opposite of the invisible. The opposite of the invisible is perhaps certainty. Yet ironically, the inverse of invisible is not belief, but disbelief. It is so because, despite their historical proximity, certainty and belief are logically distinct. Belief implies an open, openness to the possibility of thinking through, where certainty implies an available answer. The visible is a form of logical certainty, a device of the known where belief suggests that there might be something else, the invisible, that is as yet unknown and will forever be in flux and can never be pinned down. To better understand the distinction between visibility and doubt, and invisibility as belief, <clears throat> let us briefly consider magic. For magic to work, people do not have to believe what they see. Quite the contrary. They have to suspend their disbelief in what they see. The logical equivalent of doubt. The very doubt that is the operational basis of seeing. Magicians are not successful because people believe what they see, but people but because they momentarily defer their judgment and believe what they might otherwise doubt. Any careful consideration of magic generally leads to an explanation that demystifies the trick that was observed. It takes all the fun away from that momentary transcendence to a space where certainty gives way to possibility. But once the trick is discovered and the truth is known, the joy escapes, certainty returns, and disbelief triumphs. We return to our fixation on seeing as believing when, in fact, seeing is necessarily a form of doubt. I would argue that in writing about the distinction between fixed and dynamic, one needs to address what Stuart Hall saw, uh, uh, mentions, more or less at the birth of, uh, of cultural studies in the 50s. <coughs> And what he suggests is that we are wont to ad uh, ascribe a degree of certainty to things like, let's say, culture. We wish it to be when, in fact, culture is always becoming something else. We want it to be fixed. 
And the reason we assert so unnaturally a fixedness onto something like culture is to make it controllable. Alfred North Whitehead, writing many years before Hall, described this as a form of misplaced concretism, assuming the steadfast and unchangingness of something that must necessarily always be in dynamic flux in order to survive. The dynamic flux of culture is both prospective and reactionary. Entropy, the third law of thermodynamics, tells us that all matter in the universe is in a constant state of decay, and that only through decay can anything new emerge. Yet we impose certainty through the tools of our interfaces with the world to avoid the profoundly debilitating realization that, to paraphrase Marx, all that is solid melts into air. That cultures adapt to change, uh, adapt to change and indeed produce and or dampening cha dampen change is reactionary. But that cultures institute mechanisms of control, surveillance, unnatural redundancy, and counter dynamism is prospective but doomed to failure without taking into account the state of constant invisibility in which we live. Perhaps this is what Donald Rumsfeld might consider the ability to anticipate and prepare for unknown unknowns. It is in locating the prospective aspects of maintaining culture and by extension its manifestations in the forms of society and structure that invisibility can be most helpfully considered. To do so, I found it helpful to think about invisibility not as a thing, but as an intersection. Typically, we think about invisibility as the grammatical inverse to visibility. It is the lack of seeing, or it is the unseen. Some might argue that invisibility is a hidden dimension, one that is not perceived and therefore unknown. <coughs> but from what I know about the pink elephants that we looked at before, who hang out surreptitiously in, in rooms and in awkward places, invisibility can also be thought of as unseeable unhearable, powerless, or something that really just doesn't do anything for me, or that I'm too uncomfortable to talk about. It can be the unseen, it can also be the unwanted. I suggest that invisibility is not quite so simple as that which is not seen, and consider the possibility that invisibility is also equal to hidden. An opportunity, an opportunity emerges to define invisibility in this way as an intersection of seeing, hearing, power, and emotion. On the notion of seeing, invisibility can be thought of as the unseen, but this does not adequately address how objects and subjects that are seen can remain invisible, as often occurs to people of color, people who are overweight, areas of social blight, poverty, and many other things. Interestingly, a really, really simple example of this can be found in examining the fate of celebrity. Celebrity is really quite bizarre in that the more visible you are before you've been around long enough and engender a certain degree of power, you have no voice. You are very deeply controlled. You are what your image depicts. And that image depicts you in such a way that you have no ability to escape it. So you're locked down into an, an aspect of seeing. You may be very visible in the public eye, but being visible in the public eye delimits greatly your ability to exercise voice and power, and may indeed leave you feeling powerless. We can surely see all of these people and all of these objects, but we must exercise the three additional elements of hearing, power, and emotion to recognize them as subjects, agential subjects at that. And conversely, each of these elements may enact or have enacted upon them emotion, power, and voice to alleviate or facilitate their own invisibility. <clears throat> so I have this model that I'm developing, and it's a, it's a four-dimensional model. It's four-dimensional in the sense that I figured out something the other day. Three dimensions, or anything that's three-dimensional can only be understood in that context of figured ground. Anything that's three-dimensional has to sit somewhere. And these elements work dynamically. So we have the element of seeing, seeing and not seeing. Well, if you're on a scale of zero to 100, and you're down here at zero, you can see how that's invisible. But what if you want to be unseen, but you want to be heard, the disembodied voice of the narrative? You can be at 100 and still unseen and occupy a great position of power and authority. 
because power over the ability to be seen and how you are seen and to be heard and how you are heard is significant. So that's the three dimensions. And these can move around. But this has to occur somewhere. And I've discovered recently, although I'm still working this idea out, that this often plays out in an aspect of emotion. I have some crude sort of stories that I could explain this better with, but I, I'll, I'll defer to the end, and perhaps we can explore this further. But let's think about the negation of the binary of seeing for a second. Bell Hooks <clears throat> describes in her book, Class Matters, how the overseeing of people of color attached to images of poverty and violence and other social ills delimits the possibility of both seeing those people seeing these people or anyone else in those positions, or hearing the voices of the subjects who occupy darker skin. She asks in her book, why is it that the face of poverty in the United States is a black face when the vast majority of people who are poor in the United States are white? This concurrently undercuts the exercise of most forms of social power over physical power, encourages a sense of uh, it encourages a sense of emotional or affective, uh, affective play, reduces voice, reduces power, increases visibility. As an intersection, invisibility goes well beyond the binary of seeing by addressing what Foucault describes as the discursive construction of subjects, the coming together of interpretive senses to discipline and transform open-ended subjects into closed and limited objects, objects that we can trade and transform as we wish. We tend to restrict our interpretation of invisibility to this corporeal dimension, however, of seeing. But it's one-dimensional if we think about it that way. We often forget that corporeality intersects with the ephemeral hearing and is reinforced or mitigated by agency, power, and performed on the field of affect or emotion. While my research is at an early point and I'm still at the de developmental stages of this model, I have found countless examples that demonstrate its three-dimensionality and its fourth dimension of, of a field of, a field of action, or an arena of opportunity. I describe invisibility as both absence and presence, both purpose and byproduct. By, and, and some of my early examples range an entire vast array of disciplines, from healthcare to government, advertising to families, mm -hmm. divinity and spiritualism to science, from architecture to pleasure, from friendship to institutionality, labor to leisure, and beyond. The preliminary categories that I'm using and that I've developed to make sense of these examples are strategic invisibility, coincidental invisibility, and forced invisibility as they relate to structure, participation, and interpretation, and as they sit at the intersection of all of these dimensions that I've mentioned. My examples are at a rough stage, but I'm just going to show you some as we go through. So this is an example of what I would call strategy of invisibility. The Zapatistas in Mexico use invisibility as a strategy. A strategy that recognizes that voice and power and emotion cannot be met out when one is afraid of being seen. So to permit voice and power that would otherwise be usurped by fear of direct reprisal, reprisal if members of the movement could be corporeally identified, Marcos and other members of the Zapatista movement in Mexico hid their identity by wearing masks to be freer, to deploy their contradictory voices, to exercise their power, and to engender support a sense of belonging, a sense of feeling. In a book about the social history of the Third Reich, Pierre Eichelberry in the late 90s described a strategy of invisible resistance by those in forced labor conditions who appeared to be doing their jobs of tightening nuts and bolts, but just slightly less than they, were, uh, than they needed to be and that were prone to failure. The same can be seen in nominal other acts of resistance, such as something as innocuous as a slight variation to the dress code. We're stealing just enough cake that nobody knows. <laughs> In the case of governments, I've begun to explore dimensions of black ops and the PR industry as subversive or invisible messaging of uh, massaging, sorry, of consent or control. And also considered the idea, my friend Mavis talks about this as a, as a question of opacity. Opacity in the sense of the unnecessarily complicated nature of decision making, economic relationships, rules, as systems of control, both purposefully and accidentally being so obtuse that they limit the exercise of power by, the pe by people through the obf obfuscation of that power behind complicated visions of what should theoretically be necessarily straightforward things. 
Invisibility as coincidence can be understood by considering a variety of examples. And of the variety of examples, the two that I've chosen have to do with weight and have to do with poverty. The reason that I've chosen them is because when I initially looked for ideas of how, how this works, I started to think about this idea and it just jumped to me and I asked, as I want to do, other people to do my work for me. And one person originally said, well, if you want to think about invisibility, you have to think about it in terms of weight. And another person said to me, well, if you want to think about invisibility, you have to think about it in terms of the homeless. And I started to explore these areas. And I discovered that both of these areas betray the limitations of seeing by being present without being tenable. In the case of weight, several of my preliminary findings that suggest that people who occupy larger bodies feel invisible because they occupy such, uh, so much visual space in a culture that pretends to care. They describe an inverse relationship between being seen and having a voice or feeling power. As one of my early respondents described, and this of course is not a universal tendency, but this is what some of the uh, uh, um, initial respondents I had suggested. As one of my early respondents described it, being fat is almost equal to being mute. Socially, this condition of voicelessness and powerlessness has been mitigated by the ghettoized vision of the jolly old elf, as in the case of Santa Claus, or the life of the party, as in John Belushi or John Candy, being very vocal in order to compensate for being over-visible and thus unseeable. In terms of poverty, in 2006, UNICEF's report on the state of the world's children was called Excluded and Invisible. The report described invisibility as the biggest threat to the majority of the world's most vulnerable children. Invisibility that they describe, however, is not exclusively corporeal, out of sight and out of mind, though to a certain extent it is. They identify, UNICEF, how children most at risk in the world today are off of the world's agenda, falling below imaginable levels of poverty, forgotten without self-representation and outside of the flows of power in society, excluded from the hallowed halls of decision makers and left to do with untenable material living conditions. I haven't really explored this idea much, but I'm going to, and sorry you can't see this well, but this is the idea of the rest of a child in, in, in Haiti. There is a whole cultural structure of invisibility that's attached to the rest of a child, the child that is given up to a wealthy family to take in and essentially have as a slave. The child doesn't exist, except to be beaten when nothing happens, or when, when nothing that is expected happens, happens during the course of their daily chores. But I'm going to move on to the area of forced invisibility. I'd like to talk more about that, but I have a lot of slides. Forced invisibility can be seen in such things as official exile. In this way, invisibility can be thought of as an absence, an act of purposefully turning one's back to render, objectionable, render the objectionable unseen, to silence opposition by having it disappear or become unseeable. Yet as we know, exile is a potent liminal space both for those who occupy it and for those who cause it. Because being officially unseen, particularly when, it, when exile includes a physical relocation or physical restriction, permits the exercise of voice that might otherwise be constrained. Examples of this include the Dalai Lama, who, when I was in Toronto for a conference in October, had about 40,000, 50,000 people sitting in front of him, who may otherwise not. Or Aung San Suu Kyi in Myanmar, who is locked away in a house, but and probably would never have been known if she hadn't been. And then there's the writings of people like Edward Said, who, though he wrote about exile and being in limbo while he was relegated to living in the United Kingdom, spoke very actively and very uh, uh, vociferously in a way that he couldn't if he had stayed in his home country. Each occupied a body that was respectively physically separated from the corporeal attention of the state from which they were banished, but whose voice was amplified through an act of forced official invisibility, where through their official death to the state, a new voice emerged that could not be as easily controlled by the very state from which they were banished. <clears throat> but I also need to think about invisibility as a form of presence, and think about where it comes from. And to a certain extent, I'm going to suggest that invisibility is of nature. In the natural world, invisibility is a state of opportunity. So this is where the spiders come in. 
Spiders, as an example, employ invisibility in multiple aspects of their negotiation of the world. They use the concept of camouflage to blend in. And what's the benefit of blending in? Being seen, but not being seen. There, but not there, in order to lay in wait and to surprise their prey. By, seeing, uh, by seeming to be part of the normality of context, spiders hide in plain sight. They're quiet, and if equipped with incredible, and they generally tend to be equipped with incredible <coughs> physical power, relative to their size, of course. It's all per capita. When their prey is lulled into a sense of safety, the trap is set, and they spring into action. But they also use webs, and they use their webs as a form of an invisible trap. You can see a spider web, but rarely unless it is very large or illuminated just in the right way. And if you live near me, you walk into them all the time. <laughs> hate that. Still, spiders don't hide their webs. Instead, they place them right in the middle of recognized routes of travel for small, of, of smaller in, uh, insects. The web is constructed in such a manner that it has dozens of small and powerful nodes that connect and that allow it to maintain its integrity if accidentally disturbed by something too large to be eaten, like us. And in much the same way as they hide in plain sight, they hunt and trap within a state of invisibility. They understand context much better than most of us. Interestingly, as people, We've taken up this same practice of purposefully hiding, blending in, because becoming a part of the context of vision. Animals that fall victim to hunters do so most often when the hunter is unseen, or at least not seen as a threat. When the animal feels safe, unwatched, unheard, and able to carry on in the presence of the hunter, invisibility is used as a way to circumvent the natural instinct of self-preservation through flight of the disturbed context, from a disturbed context. My argument about this whole idea is predicated on the negation of a simple binary, visible, invisible, seen, unseen. But I find myself within an offshoot binary to explain why. And that is, if invisibility is a process of nature, visibility is a process of humanity in the sense of the, the discursive construction of subjects into disciplined objects. Among the most notable groups of people in our world who, if we were to speak universally, which of course we know we can't. I mean, I write that all the time, too general. If we were to speak universally, one could imagine that this uh, practice can be very well observed when considering the multi-dimensionality of seeing, hearing, power, and emotion in the lives of children across societies in both the sense of absence and presence and for vastly different reasons. On the invisibility of children, well, I will suggest that the post-millennial generation of children, more than almost any in the past, faces incredible pressures to be perfect. That doesn't sound so bad, right? Perfect isn't so bad. Why not aim for something good? High expectations, better results. Well, the movement towards perfect did not start with this generation, and I'm sure everybody could say that their parents expected a lot from them. And perhaps you might say now that your parents, ex uh, uh, parents today expect a lot from their children, but perhaps less than your parents expected from you. But I would suggest that this movement towards perfect has taken a different sort of shift. And it didn't start with this generation, but it's accelerating at a remarkable clip and in a very different sort of way, buttressed by increasingly pervasive methods to achieve perfection. Evidence from contemporary depictions of children suggests that this process starts long before birth with such practices as pervasive as sex selection to something as seemingly innocuous as planning what, state, uh, what, what year to have a child based on a stage of one's career. And this carries well forward into what was previously the start of adulthood, which as we know has extended from 17, 18, 19 to somewhere in the early 30s. And that sounds humorous, but it's true. <laughs> One can observe how the privileging of perfection has created new subcategories in childhood, such as the tweens or the terrible twos, periods that place an inverse pressure on the traditional bumpy arc of social development. This arc involves a nonlinear 
self-discovery, failure, success, failure, success, relationship. But this is done in an attempt to control moments of active, active subject formulation on the part of children and subsequently to ex impose a singular external structure of what is a multi-layered and multi-dimensional process. During times that deviate from a linear progress through childhood towards a desired perfection, parents are currently and contemporarily actively encouraged to manage and control their children in order to keep them on track towards this perfection. This perhaps has always been the case, but it's different now. And, you know, for the sake of time, I won't tell you why, but it's different now. Along the way, children's voices tend to be silenced. They are trotted out as spectacles of possibility and achievement. In the race for perfection, children, in the race for perfection, the race for perfect children, sorry, has been manifest in multiple forms. It can be seen in various social processes and material goods, services, and language used to describe contemporary children, seen but not heard. Ironically, in this growing attention to children manifest as a desire for perfect perfection, an important thing happens. Children as agential subjects are rendered invisible. To be sure, as Philippe Arias reminds us, the notion of the ideal child is centuries old. Notions of the golden child abound in literature and legend, and the thought of child as savior is the cornerstone of many religions across the world. Indeed, since the late Industrial Revolution, the idea of the angelic child, or the child to be crafted in the image of God, has abounded in Western cultures. What is different today is the intensity with which children are treated not as subjects to be groomed towards this image, but as material objects and not as moral and agential subjects. All in the name of perfection. The contemporary interface between adults and children can be characterized as a broad form of material fetishization of the child, heretofore unseen, or at least not at the level that it is. Building on Marx's description of the fetishization of commodities, thinking about today's children is marked by an emptying of their subjective potential and an infusion of other fantastical expectations, many of which ran, run counter to the possibility of independent subject formulation altogether. Much is the same as any disposable trinket, Children today are emptied of any natural subjective authority and refilled with externally defined expectations and objective potentialities. Today, children are not invisible in the binaristic sense of seen, unseen. They're invisible because of how often and how they are seen, how often and how they are heard, and how often and how they are controlled. Despite the growing visibility of children in contemporary Western cultures, in Western societies, on a micro level, the family, on a macro level, society, modern children are invisible in a multidimensional sense in that their increased visibility is flanked by decreases in their subjective agency and their ability to be conceived as anything other than deferred protected assets, silenced by the deafening pursuit of a utopic goal of perfection. On the invisibility of children as and through control, Opportunities for children's self-expression are relegated and their cho are, re are regulated, highly regulated, and their choices are carefully scrutinized at every step. Perhaps this has always been the way. Children's movements through the world are also highly managed. And you can see this as that dilemma. My parents used to let me go out and play in the street, and now they don't. Their routines are rarely spontaneous or self-directed, and interestingly, when they are, they are often depicted in negative terms. The control of children can be seen in all aspects of society, from family to schools, from the playground to the sports field. <coughs> and interestingly enough, what's fascinating about that, there's a woman by the name of Deborah Pepler at York University at the Lamarche Center who studies violence. The Lamarche Center and the study of violence in society. And she engaged in this very unusual uh, um, research uh, uh, exercise to discover triggers of violence. She discovered that teachers miss 80% of what children recognize as triggers of violence. 80%. By assuming that we know what's best, we assume that we know what's going on. Rather than the control of children decreasing over time in virtually every society in the world today, there's an increase of control that can be observed. The objectification of children helps smooth this control all by, while rendering children invisible as agential subjects. I was gonna show some YouTube stuff, 
because last week I heard a, 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 um, a, a discussion about whether or not it's fair for adults to act as substitute, uh, uh, to provide substitute consent for displaying their children to the world. If you're the one taking the, taking the video, and you're the one posting the video, and you're the one giving consent, perhaps we haven't really considered that dynamic well enough. The control of children is not always overt and is often has a cumulative impact that needs to be further explored and better understood. But a gentleman by the name of Michael Unger has described this, the stacking of small techniques of control of children as a bubble wrap syndrome. Within this syndrome, children are wrapped by their parents and other adults into a protective blanket of control. These controls ensure the sanctity of a child's perfectness while coincidentally dampening their ability to thrive as novel and unique subjects through experimentation with responsibility and risk. Such practices were identified as factors in, uh, contributing to increases in the onset of early mental health issues, the re, uh, reduced opportunities for independent social and emotional knowledge development in an, in a, through a decreased ability to exercise agency and to learn through failure. As they play, children are often currently safely enfolded behind shielding pads, under helmets, behind safety screens, and away from harm. While I do appreciate the benefits of this sort of prophylaxis, it's important to recognize that they concurrently mediate children's subjective material interaction with a natural and social world. Restrained and protected children today are removed from all but the most catastrophic of consequences. Appreciating consequences, however, at a micro level is an important element of subject formulation. Without ever negotiating consequences on one's own, what, we, what you are left with is a prescriptive rather than a gentle response to the unexpected. Innovation is dampened in place of order. Always already knowing becomes a substitute for finding one's way. This can also be seen in the world of children's play. Steve Klein and Ellen Sider, both writing in the mid-90s, and another person uh, by the name of Marcia Kinder describes this as well. Uh, they've described the commercial material dimensions involved, uh, sorry, the commercial material dimensions of control involved in children's play. Noting that children's toys are articulated to comprehensive consumptive experiences, these authors identify how play increasingly occurs in controlled environments and with pre-programmed outcomes. Children's imaginations, which is the tagline for the new Lego Universe game, join in the fight against those who would seek to squash imagination, but in our structured narrative. Children's imaginations, the font of which is the realm of agency as subjects to interact with and interpret the world, are replaced by packaged storylines and limitations on novelty. As a group of, oh, sorry. I forgot this part. This is <laughs> Techniques, Foucault might describe these elements of control as disciplinary devices used to teach or prepare children for the way that things ought to be. And this might well be a necessary part of socialization. The need for socialization of children, I'm not questioning. What I am questioning, however, is the increasingly pervasive mechanisms of control exacted upon children that usurp subjective subjectivity and introduce a troubling and enveloping invisibility. It is my contention that Control encourages the invisibility of a child by removing the novelty of the subject, replacing it with careful and calculated movements of an object through a foreseeable and circumnavigable, circumnavigable map, a fixed map. The shape, in the, uh, the shape of the pot of gold found under the X on this map is the ephemeral and elusive vision of perfection that we <coughs> seek for our children. But as Alfred Korzybski reminds us, the map is not the territory. It is a representation of the territory, 
It is a possibility, but it is limited. In the end, that example shows the main way in which invisibility impacts children is the negation, or sorry, is in the negotiation of the manifestation of power, voice, and vision as played out on the ground of emotion, either by children or about children. Often, in this case, as a manifestation of fear. We are afraid for our children, so we control them. But we are equally afraid of our children, because they might somehow be unique. Ironically, the most opaque manifestation of fear over children in the contemporary world today is played out in the realm in which I play most, which is that supposed realm of digital culture. We fear for our children that they will be left behind if we do not get them into the digital world early and pervasively enough, even if we don't necessarily understand the implications of this digital world. Or perhaps we don't understand the digital world at all. Or, on the other hand, we simply fear our children as they surpass us in their dexterity with respect to what seems like an ever-changing and remarkably fast media environment. I would argue that media scholars today hardly need to make the case that we are living in a media-saturated world anymore. That used to be the case. Ten years ago when I was proposing what I was going to do for my dissertation, I said that exact statement. Because we live in a media-saturated world and so on and so on and so on, and my dissertation advisor came back and said, where's your proof? I was dumbfounded. I don't need to make that case anymore. Media are simply everywhere. But despite this matter of fact, I'm going to argue that media technologies are more and more invisible by the day. I might be so bold as to, suge to suggest that the very speed at which new media technologies <laughs> surface and the depth to which these various and diverse media technologies penetrate all levels of society is both cause and arbiter of this state of invisibility. Media technologies are invisible because they are so deeply integrated into the context of our lives that they no longer seem out of place and therefore are unseeable, at least to the extent that they once were. To link this back to the idea of spiders, this is a more or less depiction of the World Wide Web. Many of the new, new media technologies that we come to rely on are predicated on a replication of the invisibility employed by spiders. Both in terms of establishing an unseen but unseeable web, but also in terms of operating sneakily and in the shadows, capturing information and bringing it back for consumption. This is the Googlebot that goes out and finds all that stuff that you put out there. In terms of technology, I am asking today what is more important, the medium of delivery or what it delivers. And while McLuhan is often dismissed as a technological determinist embodied by his famous saying that it's the medium that is the message. Initially, that made sense because the physical medium as the message in a moment when media technologies tended to both shape their content and possess a vast social agency in impacting their surroundings in multiple forms from facilitating the spread of the Roman Empire through the lightness of paper, to laying the groundwork for the overturning of the divine right of kings through the advent of movable type and the printing press, thus busting the monopoly of knowledge held by monks and the elites, to something as mundane as changing in where you place your living room furniture. The medium was the message. To be sure, these experiences of media technologies still impact society today although not quite so uniformly, un universally, or unequivocally. And while it's not uncommon to find a line of people waiting to be the first to own a new technology, because, you know, I'm still sad that I missed the opening day for the iPad. I got one eventually, but it wasn't the same. It wasn't, it wasn't the iPad, it was one of them. <laughs> I was upset. But like the Apple-loving hordes who came before me, or will follow, or the Xbox, or PS3, or you fill in the name, or whatever it is that you look for. I wanted this new manifestation of a communication technology. But on further reflection and paying closer attention, I'm not really sure why. 
I don't have what McLuhan and perhaps Innes had at the dawn of television or at the dawn of radio in the broadest sense. A sense of the singularity of the newness of this new media technology of the day. They repeat a lot of things. But the fact is that most old new media technology came to what can be romantically thought of as a media-naive world. One where old new media users marveled at the revolutionariness of media technologies and eagerly awaited what new technological wonders they would bring. But I would suggest that today, while we are still offered this sense of technological wonder, our desires are often far less requited. We still flock to many new media in hordes, but not necessarily the same size or constitution as in the past. So if the medium is no longer the message, why do we do it? It's not the promise of revolution, nor the cleverness of a sales pitch, or even despite what you might believe, the absolute need to keep up with society. The short answer is that we're looking for the holy grail of ways to play Donkey Kong. When we want, where we want, and how we want. And if you don't like Donkey Kong, that's okay. Maybe you like H&R Puffin stuff. Long since off the air, out of syndication, hard to find. Or maybe you want to keep alive that last crumpling object. That picture of your grandparents or your great-grandparents. Perhaps you want to tell your children where they came from by being able to access documents that demystify this point of origin. But I'm going to suggest that indeed the reason, the reason that the medium is no longer the message, that the media technologies today, despite their ubiquity, are invisible, is because of three main ideas. Convergence is a presumed inevitability that infects most new media technologies at one level or another <laughs> and permits content to be the main focus of the average user's attention. Because media content is increasingly designed to be platform independent and portable. Limiting the extent to which individual media technologies are treated as the sole arbiter of form over function until and unless one notices a media technology most when it breaks or presents a disruption to the natural flow of things. That's that virus you get because you don't have a Mac like me. <laughs> and only when this disruption occurs in a natural contextual home does this make a difference. The importance of the system of delivery that is, the medium that once was the message is often only magnified to the level of perception when it becomes disruptive. Returning to the main point of my argument in this section that media technologies are increasingly invisible, displaced by the very content that they deliver, invisibility is not the absence of seeing the technology, which to a certain extent can be true. It is instead the overseeing of technology to the extent that when it works, and what it, when it does what we expect it to do, it becomes unseeable. Media technologies do not create the supposed digital culture that our children are presumed to occupy, and perhaps we do too. The digital culture about which we are so afraid. Contemporary technologies fall into a place that forms what might be considered a digital context. And in this digital context, what we are looking for is a return on the rhetoric that media technologies today are things we can't live without. Like air, to which we rarely pay any attention unless it becomes foul or it's made to be so purposefully. As we come to think about media technologies as things we can live with, can't live without, invisibility is at work. Context is created, and we feel overwhelmed. So we muster up our fear as a rallying cry that embodies an ahistorical lack of wisdom in the name of pursuing a fleeting degree of knowledge. Knowledge of technologies, specific instances and specific utterances that, as we know, will be discarded and, quickly moved on, uh, and we will quickly move on. I have a, well, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna skip the advertising section till the end. So if you're really interested, we'll, we'll we'll do into that. But I'm gonna by way of conclusion, why is this important? Why is invisibility important? This is really that so what question. 
One of the few things that I've learned in my career is that the most profound ideas tend to be incredibly obvious and sufficiently simple enough to be able to be applied across many areas of consideration without significant alteration. This does not make them any less complicated, but nevertheless incredibly pervasive. I argue that invisibility is one such concept. As a concept, invisibility has not been sufficiently constructed, yet it occupies an important location in every aspect of society. Returning again to Anthony Wilden, who uses Charles Saunders Peirce's notion of thirdness in his development of a context model of communication. He describes how every aspect of knowledge is predicated on connecting two discrete elements through the mediation of a third. Taking Irving Goffman at his face value, Goffman who, as, you, uh, as I mentioned earlier, described the notion of invisibility as context. This means that the invisible, or invis the state of invisibility, is the always present position of thirdness. As an aspect of everything we know and can know about the world we occupy, we cannot understand the figure unless we make sense of the ground. Put simply, invisibility is everywhere all the time, and developing a theoretical framework for understanding invisibility beyond a simple binary of seeing has tremendous potential. It, if I might be so bold, I would like to suggest that all research is research about invisibility. Although not obviously, not always obviously so. Is not all research an attempt to make sense of and transform things that are found in this state of invisibility, in this process of invisibility, into the visible? To carve out something fixed and concrete? To make it the known, the understood? to engage in the web of lies that Nietzsche describes as necessary in order for us to negotiate the world. If this proposition is indeed true, and I do believe it is, assuming that illumination is simply an act of drawing out the unknown from the shadows, making it seeable, well, this is limited without a recognition of the other concurrent dimensions of power, voice, and desire acting upon our ability to see. And considering that these things occur always already in concert, whether we are want to believe it or not. Thank you.